Hello and welcome to the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We are on session 1. We are going to study the book of Revelation in greater detail. Uh, today we are going to study the introduction. So we are going to look at the basics, how we got here and why we are studying the book of uh, Revelation. So, so one of the key verses in the book of Revelation is, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. You can see that in Revelation 22, 12. So whenever I read this verse, a story comes to my mind. So let me start with a story for you. So in a lighter moment, just a story here. A missionary went to a foreign country to preach the gospel, and he was invited to a church to preach the gospel and he went on went to preach on a Sunday morning so he was given a pulpit so he stood at the pulpit and he started um, begin to preach so before he began to preach he started opening with a prayer so he closed his eyes he started opening his message with prayer so this church is a very old church there is no air conditioning and it was very hot and humid so a young fellow from the church thought probably he could help the pastor, so he bought a pedestal fan. So he bought this pedestal fan and turned it on and put it at a full speed. And the pastor, pastor was praying, and by the time he opened his eyes, his notes is gone. So it's nowhere to be seen. All the notes that he wrote for the, uh, the preaching is gone. So the only thing he could remember at this time is, Behold, I come quickly. So he thought probably if I start that and then probably the message will come to his mind. So he said, behold, I come quickly. So still he could not recollect what are his thoughts. So he said one more time, he said, behold, I come quickly. So he was panicked at this time because he could not, he don't have the notes and he has to preach his sermon. So he just, he just hit this pulpit hard and then said one more time, behold, I come quickly. You know, this pulpit broke and he fell on the first floor, first row of the pew. And there was an old lady sitting there and he said, Ma'am, I am very sorry, I, this pulpit broke and I fell here. And she said, No, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be sorry because you warned me three times. Behold, I come quickly. I should have moved to a different location. <laughs> so that's what she said. So anyway... So with that, let's get to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has three, a uh, few themes. So the main themes are listed here. The themes in the Revelation, if you look at the first chapter, it is talking about the Christ, the risen Christ, the glorious Christ. And when we look at chapter 2 and 3, it talks about the church, the letters to the seven churches. And when we look at chapters 4 to 22, it talks about the consummation, the final things, how it is all going to end. So that is what we are going to see. So today, as I said, I'm not getting into detail. I'm not going to get into any verses. I'm going to just give you a background of this book. So the themes of Revelation, the Christ, the church, the consummation. When we talk about the Christ, Sometimes people have different understanding. You know, even if you talk to two different people and ask who is Jesus Christ, both sometimes give different answers. I just want to bring all of us to the same page of un one understanding who Jesus Christ is. We need to look at the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what does it say? In, in John 1, ch chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We all know, those who have the Bibles and we have attend the classes and we attend churches, we know who this Word talking about. It's Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. In other words, you can say, in the beginning was Jesus Christ, and the Jesus Christ was with God, and Jesus Christ was God. So let that sink in. So the Word is a reason, and that's the Logos, and He was in the beginning. Sometimes people have wrong notion that Jesus Christ was born at Bethlehem and that is his beginning. No, no, no. The Bible clearly says in the beginning was the word. So as far as you can go back and think about the time, before the time began, Jesus Christ was there. The word was there. 
Of course, the name Jesus was given at birth, but Jesus Christ was there from everlasting to everlasting. So let us all have that same understanding of who Jesus Christ is. So, and the word, the whatever the word we talked about, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that is when, when, when the word took on human flesh and born in Bethlehem as a babe, that is, what, uh, that is when Jesus Christ came into this world. So that is what verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory, of, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And now when we go to the next verse, John chapter 1 verse 29 it says, And the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So here you see John the, was introducing Jesus as the Lamb of God. Why am I showing you these passages? I showed you the previous passages about the Word of God and I am showing you the Lamb of God. So these are the two themes that run through the book of Revelation. So that is why I am showing you this. The, the Word of God, the Lamb of God. So these two things will continue through the book of Revelation. And behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We need to understand why Jesus came into this world. So most of us are familiar with this verse, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants us to be saved, so he sent his only begotten Son into this world, so to die for us, think about that. God sending his only son to die for us. In verse 17 it says, For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So now we all know the reason why Jesus Christ came into this world. It is not to condemn the world, but to save the world. But most of the time we stop at these two verses or even stop at verse 16. We will never go to verse 18, which is very important. Here is a very important verse. I want all of you to pay attention to verse 18. He who believes in him, that's Jesus Christ, is not condemned. You see that? He who believes in Jesus Christ is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Do you get that? So if a person does not know Jesus Christ, they are already condemned. You and I were condemned to death to eternal hellfire before we came to Christ. There was a point in time that we repented of our sins and asked Jesus Christ to come into our lives, asked Jesus Christ to be our Savior and Lord, and before that we were all condemned. And now because we put our trust in Jesus Christ and because now we put our uh, faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved from that condemnation. Do you get it? So there is a big transaction that happened at the cross. Jesus took our sins and he gave his righteousness to us. So that is why this verse is very important. If you look around, if you look at a lot of people around, there are so many people, those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. Let me remind you one more time. A lot of people, they accept Jesus as Savior, but they don't accept Jesus as Lord. But that will not work that way. If you accept Jesus as a Savior, He also has to be your Lord. Because you, people can believe in Jesus. People can believe that Jesus came into this world. People can believe that He is the Son of God. What good is that of having that kind of a belief and not surrendering their life to Him? You see the point? That's why in the book of James, James says, Even demons believe and tremble. So James make a point saying that, you know, just believing is not enough. We need to surrender our lives to Christ. We need to surrender our lives to Jesus and make him our Lord. So when we hear the word of God, we need to also obey. We also need to surrender our lives to him and make Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That is very, very important. Most of the time, many of the people, those who go to churches, they don't realize that. They just go to church. They say, that, okay, I believe in Jesus and I am saved. No, you are not. If you just think that way that you are not, because the reason for that is 
you need to surrender your life and also you need to accept him as your lord and savior that is very important so they are, that's why jesus said there will be many people on that day they said lord have we not done this have we have done even cast out demons have we done this and you know attended church all these days and on that day jesus is going to say i never knew you i never knew you why is jesus going to say that because they have religion but they don't have relationship if you have a relationship if you go to god and talk to him and ask him his counsel and uh, you know uh, lord search me and see if there is in any wicked way in me and if you have a closer relationship jesus will never be able to say i don't know you you see my point when you have a relationship with someone that person will never say that i never knew you but if you have a religion if you just know but if you have never have a relationship that is a very sad thing so that is why i am trying to bring it to your attention tonight the gospel of jesus christ is basically you need to make him jesus as your lord and savior because he died for you and for me and sometimes people do not have a understanding of the gospel and sometimes people say they are saved so if you ask them what are you saved from they don't have a clue what they are saved from they are saved we are saved from the eternal damnation we just saw that you know everyone is condemned right so everyone is condemned and before we were saved we were all condemned we were saved from that condemnation so sometimes when we ask what is the gospel they don't have a clue what the gospel is here i just want to give you a quick summary of the gospel which is written in 1st corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 uh, to 5 paul writing to for the corinthian church here he says for i delivered to you first of all that which i also received that is the gospel that christ died for our sins keep that in mind the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that we were sinners and that christ died for our sins gospel starts with the sin Christ died for our sins again it is not just paul come up with an idea okay let me say this no he is saying according to the scriptures what scriptures the old testament scriptures so it was right from the beginning bible is very clear about what this is so paul was saying christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that's why if you open your bibles to isaiah chapter 53 you can see how gospel was presented there that christ was pierced he was bruised for our iniquities so christ died for our sins if you are taking notes this is one very important point christ died for our sins and next and that he was buried there are religions in this world today that they say that jesus did not die because he did not die he was not buried but bible clearly says christ died so that is why it is very important to acknowledge that he was buried and he, he rose again so he died for our sins he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures again this is all according to the scriptures so this is the gospel in a nutshell if you read chapter uh, first corinthians chapter 15 gospel is presented very meticulously there one once eternal destiny is determined on earth if a person is born on earth and living on earth and his eternal destiny is determined on earth once a person dies there is no second chance there are people who say once they die they can you know go and you know go to some place where they can borrow some merit from other no 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 only one life soon it will pass away whatever we do on this earth for christ that will last so uh, once eternal destiny is determined on earth when we have breath given to us when we are still breathing this is when we can make our choice whether we want to spend eternity with jesus christ or whether we want to spend eternity in hell so bible is very clear on those two places anyone who believes in jesus is not judged or condemned in the future judgment so if you trust jesus and if you accept him as savior and lord you are not going to be judged otherwise every person is going to stand before the great white throne judgment according to the bible and we are going to study that in the book of revelation you know, towards the end and how a person gets saved 
that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Again, let me reiterate here the point here. It is not just the belief, although it is the, the verse clearly says that you have to believe, but it also says that you have to believe with your heart. When you believe something with your heart, you will respond to that. So that is the point here. So if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Sometimes people believe, but they will, not, they will act as if they don't believe on the gospel. So that is why it is very important for us to act on what we believe. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 also declares how we are um, preaching, how we are saved. And the gospel is very important, especially when uh, Paul was writing to the Romans during that time, people was mocking at him. Are you following this crucified person? Are you following the way? They used to call the Christians the way. And in, in midst of all that, Paul was saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. In midst of mocking, in midst of persecution, Paul boldly says, I don't care what the world system thinks. I don't care what others think. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. If we wholeheartedly believe the gospel that Jesus died for my sins, that Jesus died and rose again for my sins, you are saved. So that is why Paul was so adamant in saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Underline the word everyone. There are sometimes people say only only few people will be saved and all that nonsense. But Bible is saying whoever believes, whoever trusts Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive their sins will be saved. So it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it, for in the in for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Again, Bible also says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So we are saved because of our faith in Christ Jesus and that's how we receive the gift of salvation. It is a gift. Salvation is a gift and you have to receive it with through faith. So again, without faith it is impossible to please God. So this is basically the uh, gospel in a nutshell and this is why we need to understand who Jesus Christ is. And at the same time, we also need to understand we are in a war with an enemy, invisible enemy. There is a fallen angel called Lucifer, Satan. And Satan is always trying to uh, destroy the plans of God. So that's why Satan is trying to lead people astray from God. That's why Satan will try to entice and bring people into sin. So we need to understand there is an invisible enemy but God has not left us alone. He has given us how to fight and he has given us certain instructions. So I'm not going to take too much time on this, but I just want to give you with a verse to understand we are at war. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, because God, you know, Paul is writing clearly, our fight is not with the flesh and blood. Sometimes people think they are fighting with their spouse, they are fighting, fighting with their employer or something, although they may act that way. But behind the scenes, understand this, behind the scenes in all the fighting that's going on here, there's a spiritual battle going on. For that matter, one day Jesus turned around and said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So he was talking to Peter but Satan has enticed, uh, 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 Jesus was talking to Peter, but Satan has enticed certain words through Peter. And Jesus had to rebuke Peter, but in rebuking Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So, but I, I don't encourage you to go and talk to your husband or wife, say, get thee behind me, Satan. So, but you need to understand that you need to pray and be mindful of there is a spiritual battle going on. And if you pray, you will see the deliverance instead of just arguing and fighting with your spouse or employer or whoever it may be. 
but if you take a moment and pray about that situation you will definitely see deliverance that is my experience and i am promising you that you will see deliverance instead of fighting with one another just take time and understand that there is a spiritual battle verse 13 therefore because there is a spiritual battle therefore take up the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand so god has given us a spiritual armor so put on the whole armor of God. I don't have time to go through this, explain this whole armor of God. You can read that in Ephesians chapter 6. You know, the, the whole uh, armor of God is uh, described there. In essence, take up Jesus Christ and you will be able to withstand all evil. You know, take up the gospel, take up faith, take up salvation. It's all tied to one, one person, that is Jesus Christ. In other words, Therefore, take up Jesus Christ in your life that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So that is how you are going to win the, win the battles. So you can read that in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. In, a sum, in summary, what have we learned about the gospel? All have sinned. All are condemned to death. But Jesus is the Son of God who came to rescue us from this eternal damnation. And those who believe in Jesus' virgin birth, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and second coming are not condemned. If you believe in Jesus' birth, because it has to be a supernatural birth, it, and he died for you and me, he was buried and he rose again. Not only that, he went up to heaven, ascension, and he is going to come back. That is important. Sometimes people live as, the, the, as, the, as if, Jesus is not going to come back. But keep, you, keep that in mind. If you read all the New Testament scriptures, everywhere you see Paul saying his focus is the blessed hope. He calls it a blessed hope. The blessed hope is Jesus Christ is going to come back. Even he told his disciples, I am going to the Father to prepare a place for you. When I prepare a place for you, I am going to come back. So always remember, that is our blessed hope. If, if there is no blessed hope, then what is, what is the life we are living? It is, you know, in other words, Paul says that if there is no resurrection, if there is no second coming, then we are the most miserable people in this world. But that is not the case. Jesus is going to come back. So Jesus is going to come back for his bride, the church. You know, the, so that is the blessed hope we have. And we fight an invisible enemy, Satan, but God provided us the whole armor of God to fight the spiritual battles. So I think with that we understand what the gospel is, how a person gets saved. This is very, very important. The reason I want to bring this to your attention is sometimes people are interested in just studying the Bible, knowing the future things, and these are all good. But are you saved? Are you saved? That is very important. And once you are saved, then God commanded us to learn more, the diligently study the word of God. So now let's get to the book of Revelation. What is the title of the book? Sometimes you see uh, 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 pictures like this, or some of your Bibles will say, the revelation of Saint John the Divine. So as you see on the slide here, sometimes people have their Bibles, which says the revelation of Saint, uh, Saint John the Divine. Of course, John have, John have written this book, the book of Revelation, but it is not John's revelation. It is not, keep this in mind, this is not an accurate title. It is not John's revelation. And we will see what the right uh, translation, the right title should be. So before I go to the right title for the book, I will show you a couple of wrong titles, how people come up with the revelation of John the Divine. So it is not John the Divine. And sometimes people say revelations. It is not revelations. It is revelation of Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. Even sometimes people say, I'm going to revelations class. No, 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 don't say that. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation. It is one revelation. It is not revelations. Keep that in mind. So the right title is, unlike most of the books, you don't have to worry about too much. Then what is the title of this book? Tell me. So here is it. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So the revelation of Jesus Christ is the title. So here is uh, the picture from my Bible. 
it uh, it says the revelation of jesus christ and you don't have to worry about that too much if you look at the first verse if you open your bible and if you uh, open to chapter 1 verse 1 it says the revelation of jesus christ so there you go so the title of this book is given in first verse the revelation of jesus christ so that is the title of this book so what this book contains what started in genesis comes to a dramatic conclusion in revelation so that is why i like the bible very much because you know although there it is written by several authors and all that it it is having a consistent theme god promised that there is going to be a savior coming out and what started in genesis comes to a dramatic conclusion in revelation where christ is going to come and rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years and for and then after that for eternity so we are going to see all that in the book of revelation when we continue to study and when we get to chapters 20 21 and 22 so we are going to see that how it is going to uh, end in all its uses revelation refers to something or someone once hidden become visible there are certain things that people did not see in the in the past but those are revealed in the book of revelation that is what we are going to see what this book reveals or unveils is jesus christ in glory and sometimes when you turn your tv on and you know sometimes people comment like you know i, I then some preachers come there and they say i just talked to jesus christ this morning in my bathroom and jesus case asked me for a uh, you know i had a question and he asked me and i told him all this you know when you read the book of revelation you will understand who jesus christ is john the beloved disciple fell on his face when he saw jesus on his in his glory so don't don't be fooled with all the descriptions people give about jesus christ so we are also going to see the seven sealed scroll one of the key thing that we are going to study is the seven sealed scroll when each seal is opened there are certain things that happens and we are going to study in detail what is going to be that uh, every seal means christ will come in glory to judge and rule so we are going to study towards the end christ will come in in glory to judge and rule so when we talk about the scriptures the inerrancy of the scriptures i want to bring all of you to uh, uh, an understanding the doctrine of the bible inerrancy is an extremely important one because the truth does matter you know there are no errors in the bible when i say there are no errors in the bible i need to give you an understanding what i mean so that is what i want to explain this this issue reflects on the character of god and is the foundational to our understanding of everything the bible teaches so if the bible is false then there is no point that we need, we cannot trust god so you need to understand bible is inerrant the bible itself claims to be perfect and the words of the lord are flawless and like silver refined in a furnace of clay purified seven times so you can read that in psalm 12:6 and also it says the law of the lord is perfect every word of god is pure these claims of purity and perfection are absolute statements applied to original autographs did you catch that all these claims of purity and perfection are absolute statements applied to original autographs what does that mean the original autographs are the are the original manuscripts that was written when the author wrote like when john wrote his first book of revelation that's the autograph that's the manuscript in that copy there were no errors but later on there were scribes who copied and now the publishers the editors they put their titles and notes footnotes and all that so the my point is this the, this inerrancy does not apply to footnotes if you know if you write some footnote in your bible by the publisher or by the editor those are not in, they may make mistakes so make, uh, let this be clear the inerrancy is we are talking about the original autographs this inerrancy does not apply to footnotes or any other annotations or headings or made by the editors and publishers so just keep that in mind sometimes if you come across two different bibles with different annotations or different titles just like as i showed you 
Uh, one says uh, revelation of John the Divine, the other says uh, revelation of uh, Jesus Christ. So which one is true? Bible cannot be false. Yes, I agree, but in autographs, the original autographs, there was no errors. But when the publishers added additional material to this Bible, like the titles, the footnotes and all that, there may be, there could be some errors. So the claims of purity and perfection are absolute statements applied to original autographs. For whatever things were written before, were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We see this in Romans 15.4. So the Bible is given for our uh, understanding, for our learning. So we cannot neglect the scriptures. We cannot neglect the word of God. So we, the ho only hope comes from reading the word of God. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So one of the reasons why people stumble, one of the reasons why they cannot answer a simple question when some, someone questions them about the Bible is because they don't have a deeper understanding of the Word of God. If you thoroughly study the Word of God, you should be able to explain and you are commanded to, be, to give a defense of the faith that is in you. You don't have to go to seminary, you don't have to do all that, but at least you have to study the Word of God to give a defense of your faith. Why you believe in Jesus Christ, you know? So, and here it says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, including the book of Revelation. The reason why I uh, say that is, there are some churches in, in general, they omit the book of Revelation. They say, oh, it's too complicated. There are so many symbols. There are so much difficulty to understand the book of Revelation. So they don't even touch the book of Revelation. But here we are, we are told all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I am going to explain to you when we get to the chapters, when we get to the individual verses, how this fits in with the bigger framework. We studied from the book of Daniel the larger framework and how this fits exactly into all these things. So we need to have a bigger understanding of the how where this all fits in. The Bible consists of 66 separate books. As I said, Bible is written by uh, different, uh, penned by over 40 authors and over a period of 1600 years. Keep this in mind. They didn't have email. Moses did not send an email to John the, uh, John the Apostle saying, Hey, I'm going to write this and you continue from here. So there was no email communication. There was nothing like that. But yet, 40 different authors over 1600 years still talks about the same theme, same thing, same redemption, same redemption story. Where we started in Genesis, we continue to see the redemption story even in the book of Revelation. Somebody sometimes asks, what about the book of Ruth? You know, you, you, you may think book of Ruth is insignificant, right? Sometimes people think it is very insignificant. Why is that even there? But if you really study what is Boaz doing, Boaz is, you know, marrying a Gentile bride, which symbolizes the church. And Boaz is redeeming her to marry her. It, it, if you look at all that, what Christ did, Christ marrying the Gentile bride, that is the church. So there are so many parallels. I don't have time to explain all that. So what I'm, my point is, wherever you look, no matter what book you take and read it, Christ, you can see Christ Jesus in everywhere. So it is inspired by God. That is the main reason why it is the theme runs through all these pages of the scriptures. 66 separate books penned by over 40 authors over 1600 plus years, but yet still convey the same story. Same redemption story, same story for you, the love for you and me. It contains an integrated message. Every detail is there by design. Sometimes you may wonder why is it this particular thing mentioned? It doesn't make sense, but it is there for a reason. We studied that some of those details in the when we studied in the book of Daniel. So uh, nothing is trivial. All things are for our learning. So the more you pay attention to the details, you will find meticulous details 
how God has really orchestrated in delivering this the holy word to us. So you will be, you know, it, it really mind boggles sometimes when I read the scriptures and link all these verses from the Old Testament to the New Testament and different authors. It really boggles my mind. It's, this must be the work of God. No human author could have invented this kind of a thing. And in fact, you are going to see that kind of a theme in the book of Revelation. There are threes, there are sevens, there are twelves. There is a numerical pattern. You know, there are so many things that you will come across in the book of Revelation, which is really wonderful and interesting that, you know, how John was inspired to write this book. And now, as I said, John is the one who wrote the book of Revelation. So the Revelation written by Apostle John, you know, one of the Jesus disciple, John. So John was sent to uh, island Patmos. So when he was asked to worship the uh, uh, emperor, Roman emperor Domitian, he denied. He said, I'm, I cannot worship uh, uh, a man. I worship Jesus. So for the, for, as a result, he was exiled to an uh, island called Patmos. And there he was in a cave and Jesus appeared to him and there he wrote this book. And if you are looking, my picture behind me is that cave. So that I took a picture of that, you know, that this is the cave. Let me move aside so you can see. So it, it's kind of like a, the cave. Um, of course, they now worship this cave and, you know, a lot of things going on in this cave, which I don't agree with. But I just want to remind you, this is the picture from island Patmos and where John probably might have received his revelation. And now if you visit uh, Patmos, they will take you on a tour to show you this cave and you know all this. So that is what my point was. So to just uh, put this background. And of course I will be changing my background throughout these classes. So until we finish chapter 1 I will keep this background. When we get to chapter 2, 3 uh, then I will be changing it to the churches. The seven churches. So we'll be seeing some pictures there. And then when we get to the remaining chapters, I don't know what I'm going to put a oh, picture, so I, I will find something there. Okay, so John, who, bo who had borne witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. You don't have to struggle to find the, the author who wrote the book of Revelation. So here it says in Revelation 1, uh, chapter, one chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, John, who had borne witness to the word of God and testimony of Jesus Christ. The early church was nearly unanimous in its understanding that this refers to the Apostle John. So sometimes the reason I mention this is sometimes people will uh, come up and say, no, this is not Apostle John, this is some other John, you know, a lot of things. But uh, the point is, early church was unanimous in its understanding that this refers to Apostle John, the disciple of John. So that is the uh, who is the author. John wrote from the island of Patmos, 37 miles from Miletus in the Icarian Sea. This Roman penal colony was a place of, for, uh, of exile for political enemies of the state. Early church tradition says that John was forced to work in its mines. So when John denied worshipping the Roman Emperor Domitian, he was exiled as a political enemy of the state and he was sent there to be forced to, to work in the mines and during that time he had he got this revelation. So this author John, so what else did he wrote? So we can see he wrote the Gospel of John and that's why I showed you a couple of verses from the Gospel of John. We, we see he calls the, uh, Jesus the Word and he calls Jesus the Lamb of God. And you see the pattern also repeated in the book of Revelation. And also he wrote three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and also the book of Revelation. So Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles, and the book of Revelation. He was born, to, born at Bethsaida to Zebedee and Salome. And he is a Galilean fisherman along with Peter and Andrew. So most of the time you hear these names Peter and Andrew and uh, John. So this, uh, he, they were fishermen and he was born to Zebedee and uh, Salome. He was well connected to high priest Nicodemus and uh, uh, other, other uh, people there. So the, he was well connected to all these people. 
one of the john is one of the inner circle of jesus you can see him at the mount of transfiguration in matthew chapter 17 you can also see him in matthew chapter 9 verse 18 when raising jairus daughter john was there and even in the Oliver Discourse, Matthew 24, you can see John was there. And also at the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was crying and praying and uh, in tears and John was there. Probably he might be sleeping and Jesus has to wake them up, but uh, he was there as an inner circle. John played a leading role in the early church at Jerusalem. After ascension, after resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, John played a leading role in the early church and it was told that he was one of the pastors at the church at Ephesus for a long time. John and his brother James were called Bonerges or the sons of thunder. Sometimes they are called the sons of thunder. So that is the John we are talking about. John's gospel and revelation refer to Jesus Christ as the word as I mentioned earlier. Revelation and gospel of John describes Jesus as the lamb. And also both the, both the books, Gospel of John and Revelation, calls him a witness. And when was it written? So it was written, as I said, during the reign of Emperor, Roman Emperor Domitian, around 90 and 95 AD. So the, the, this is the time when the John was exiled to island Patmos, as I showed you earlier. So during that time, he wrote this book, and that's between 90 and 95. The spiritual decline of the seven churches also argues for the later date, 90 and 95 AD. The reason I mention this point, let me explain. Somebody might be wondering why is this point or doesn't make sense. So let me explain what this means. There are some who argue that the book of Revelation was written during the time of Nero, not Domitian. Right? When you think that way, it was written around like before 68 before AD 68. If uh, it was written during the time of Nero, it has to be written before 68. So this point makes it the churches were just coming up during that time. And now in the book of Revelation, we see there is a spiritual decline in the churches. So there is not enough time for the churches to be declined spiritually. So that is the point it is making. Of course, there are other all other points. I'm not going to bring all the arguments. So just, just making a case here. This is written during the time of Domitian and during between 90 and 95. So what is the purpose of this book? To reveal the things that must soon take place. We don't have to look too far to find its purpose. It, so it takes place uh, in verse 1. Uh, it says to reveal the things that must soon take place. If somebody comes and tells you that they are going to tell you all that what's going to happen, how much you will be interested in. And that is what this book is all about. The book is going to reveal in a very meticulous details the things that are going to happen. Of course, I'm going to explain that there are some of those things we will not be here to watch because we will be raptured before that. And I'm going to explain when we will be raptured and at what time we will be raptured and things like that. I'm not giving a date here. I am telling you during the sequence of this chapter, the chronology, at what point we will be raptured and because we are going to study the last seven years. You remember we studied the 70 weeks of Daniel. We just concluded the book of the Daniel. If you are watching this video for the first time, I would recommend that you go back and watch the videos. We have completed the book of Daniel. And there we studied the 70 weeks of Daniel. But we only covered 69 weeks. And after 69 weeks, Messiah was cut off. And nothing was there. So what happened to the 70th week? That 70th week is what we are doing now. That 70th week that what we studied in the book of Daniel is now the 70th week is covered in the book of Revelation. So Revelation is basically talking about seven years and that seven years is the last and final week of the Daniel's prophecy. So that is how you fit all these puzzles together. So this book is to reveal the things that must soon take place. So in case of Daniel, God said, close the book, seal the book. But in case of the Revelation, it says, do not seal up the words. Do not seal up the words for the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So the time is near is for the church. The time is near because Jesus said that he comes like a thief in the night. He could come any time. So for us, it is time is near. But for Daniel, 
there are several other kingdoms that has to come like the Persian kingdom that the Roman Empire all this has to come so for Daniel it is a long time a time after you know after a far time that's why the book was sealed but here do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book that's the difference between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation so the purpose of the book is to comfort persecuted Christians while exhorting them to persevere in faith in light of Christ's ultimate victory over the satanically motivated people of the earth. There was so much of persecution going on during this time when John wrote this book. So one of the reasons for this book is to comfort them, especially the first few chapters, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you see there is a lot of comfort and also it keeps saying for those who overcome. It is a message for the overcomers. For those who overcome, they are going to receive a blessing. For those who overcome, God is going to give a reward. We are going to see in a very detailed manner what those rewards are, what that overcoming means. But the purpose of this book is to comfort persecuted Christians. And also even for us today, it gives hope. You know, when you read meticulously, for, you know, there are so many prophecies that are given for the first coming of Jesus Christ. There are three times more prophecies given for his second coming. And most of those prophecies you can see, you can find out in the book of Revelation. So that is how this book is important. If first coming is that much important, second coming is even greater importance. That is my point. Each of the seven churches is encouraged to seek the reward of those who overcome the temptation to apostatize under persecution. So apostatize is people walking away from faith. When they are being persecuted, they said, forget about this Jesus Christ. I am just walking away from faith. They lose their faith. So this book is written to encourage them to persevere, to overcome, even in midst of persecution. While Revelation provides much insight into events yet to transpire on earth. It was originally written to the people in the desperate need of faith and encouragement. The only book in the Bible that promises a special blessing to the reader. The consummation of all things. Of the 404 verses that are contained in the Revelation, 278 are drawn from the Old Testament passages. Think about that. It's a significant number. Sometimes people say, oh, I don't understand the book of Revelation. It talks about, you know, all this woman and having seven stars and crowns and all. You know, most of that symbolism were drawn from the Old Testament. So if we could understand the Old Testament, where this is connected, so you can easily understand. And in fact, these symbols were given so that we can understand it better. Let me repeat this. Sometimes people say these, these symbols are making them not to understand the Bible or to understand the book of Revelation. But these symbols are given so that we would understand it better. I'm going to explain all that when we come to those chapters and those verses. The only book in the Bible that promises a special blessing to the reader, I'm going to explain this when we come to that particular verse. It says, blessed are those who read this and blessed are those who continue to obey. So we'll get to that in, at a later time again. It presents the climax of God's plan for man. So if you if you are wondering what is going to happen to this earth what is how this is all going to end this is the book that will tell you how everything is going to end so that is why i am very confident i pay little attention to little details because now i want i am 100% sure what god has promised is going to bring it to pass so now i know reading from the bible not from our newspaper reading from the bible i know what is going to happen towards the end and when you then look at the things that are happening around in the world, then you can make everything make sense. Sometimes people say, I can't understand what is going on in this world. Yeah, because you didn't pay attention to the Bible. So if you pay deep attention to the Bible, you can understand what is going on in this world. Couple of things. It will be like the days of Lot. It will be like the days of Noah. Is that are we seeing here or not? Right? All the laws that are passed, all the things that are happening... We are trending every time we are going forward towards the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. And also it says it will be there will be lawlessness will abound. We are seeing right in front of our eyes, even with the shooting that happened recently in Boulder. 
all these things when we come across all the things that are happening around it makes sense when we put the scriptures in front of us and we shouldn't be discouraged because it somebody said this we know the end of the story we win right we know the end of the story if we know the end of the story we win if you are a believer if you are a child of god we win we may go through some difficult times we may go through some difficult circumstances but we know how it is all going to end we win that is my hope that is the blessed hope as long as god gives me breath that is what i'm going to do i'm going to speak the truth i'm going to say what god has asked us to say so god has given us the the bible the revelation and we should really pay attention to the scriptures and um, put more effort in learning these things the catastrophic end crisis of present age spectacular reappearances of the king of kings in his global empire in you know, uh, interment of satan in the abuso bottomless pit so when we get to the uh, towards the end of this book we are going to see satan will be bound for a thousand years and during that thousand years jesus christ is going to literally rule and reign on this earth and there are some passages in isaiah and in other places that describes how that rule and reign going to be a, a little kid will play with a cobra a lion and a lamb will lie together so that during that time satan will be bound for a thousand years we are going to study all that you know, towards the end of this book millennial earth reign of christ so those details are given final insurrection and the abolition of sin so towards the end satan will be thrown into the lake of fire and all the with along with the antichrist we are going to see who this antichrist guy is where is he coming from and things like that i am not giving names but i am going to present a case what the what bible describes i am not coming with something new but i am going to explain from what the scripture says here and finally we are going to see the new heaven and the new earth so there are different interpretations when we read the book of revelation there are people who open the book and say oh the revelation it is all fulfilled in ad 70 uh, it was all already done in the first century so there there are different interpretations let me just bring those quickly to you and then we'll see what we are going to study the preterist view that is many of the events described in the book took place during john's lifetime so that means what they think is it is all done so there is nothing new here and historicity view the events described in the book as a panorama panorama of history from the time of john until the present so they think that all the history is what we are seeing through the book of revelation in an idealist view a general description of the battle between good and evil they don't even think about this as a the future event they think it is just a allegory between a good and evil representation but the what we believe and what i am going to teach is the futurist view while focusing on the purpose of the book for the original audience still holds that chapters 6 to 22 will be fulfilled literally in the future this is a literal interpretation this is a literal message to the future generations and this is what we are going to study so the out of all these different interpretations the interpretation that we are going to study and the right interpretation based on the literal interpretation is the few futurist view futurist view what is the important method to properly interpret the book somebody may say how how can i interpret the book of revelation right so if in any when i read something how can i interpret so the most good way to interpret the book is the most literal interpretation possible if you read something and you come across a thousand years take it as thousand years don't allegorize it sometimes people will say oh the thousand years means something this and that no when bible says thousand years it's a thousand years oh what about the symbols what about when it is talking about symbols it says it's a sign you know uh, there's appeared a sign in the sky like a woman it, it says that when it says a sign then you know how to interpret it as a sign and those signs as i said mostly drawn from the old testament scriptures so take it as a literal interpretation as possible every time and you will be on the right path don't allegorize otherwise you will assign oh this means that that means this no that is not what it it is 
and prophecy when we talk about a prophecy something that was foretold and we and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing that first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation do you see that point you cannot just take thousand years and say oh this thousand years means or oh, something else you know no no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit so you need to have a justification you need to have something that you link to in the old testament before you make a case so that is why you cannot just uh, randomly assign something uh, with the scriptures so, so no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation it is a special book as i said earlier this is a special book why is it special blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near it starts with what blessed blessed is he if you read the book of revelation if you hear the book of revelation if you understand and keep the book of revelation you are blessed that's what it means blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near you are blessed uh, you may ask john you are saying something you know there are other passages that says blessed why are you saying this is a special book if you look in joshua chapter 1 verse 8 you know meditate on it day and night when when you and there are some psalms that are talk that talks about the blessings to study, when you study the word of god in all those cases it talks about in general the scriptures all the scriptures but when you come to the book of revelation it is very explicit in saying blessed is he who reads and who hears the words of this prophecy so this book is ex- explicitly mentioned here that is why the difference of course you can study any book any any book in the bible and still you receive a blessing but my point is this book uh, mentions that i am special read me <laughs> you know it, it makes a case like that the revelation chapter 1 verse 1 finally we come to the first verse the revelation of jesus christ which god gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place and he sent and sig- signified it by his angel to his servant john so it was the message of jesus christ god gave it to jesus and he gave it to his servants and it was given through the angel to given to john who bore witness to the word of god and to the testimony of jesus christ to all the things that he saw we are going to study in the next session in a detailed manner chapter 1 every verse of it so this is just the introduction of the book of revelation so i thank you for watching and uh, if you have not watched my previous videos you i would recommend that you watch the daniel series that will make more sense when we continue to study the book of revelation if you have not subscribed to my channel please do subscribe so you will be notified of all the videos and all the future teachings so please do subscribe and if you like a video you can like it so that will encourage others to also watch and be blessed and if you uh, this is the youtube channel address you can just go to youtube dr john reddy and also you can visit my blog where i write occasionally some posts mydailydevotion.org thank you for watching see you next week